Welcome back to my channel. It's been almost a year since I started Guitar Players in Isolation, and if you are new to my channel, I have been featuring amazing Canadian guitar players. Feel free to check out my past videos of players like Steve Petico, Colin Linden, Colin Cripps, and Gordy Johnson, and many others. But today's guest is my first non-musician, but he has been instrumental in the music business for over 25 years. My guest today is Eric Alper. He now runs his own public relations company, That Eric Alper. He is a six-time nominee publicist of the year during Canadian Music Week and a 16-time Juno Award winner overseeing PR campaigns. He has worked with hundreds, if not thousands, of internationally known musicians. So stick around as we chat about his career, the music business, as it was and where it's going. We even talk about NFTs and crypto. Also, please subscribe and hit that bell notification button. You know the drill by now. It really helps the YouTube algorithm show out the videos, and I'd really appreciate it. Now, let's get on with the interview. Hey, Eric, how are you? I'm good, man. How are you? What's going on? Oh, uh, I can't complain. You know, it's... Uh, sure you can. No, I can't. Go ahead, I, complain. I've been getting so used to this pandemic thing, I'm actually starting to enjoy it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kind of hitting this, this psychological thing where um, even if everybody gets the vaccine, I'm not convinced I want to go back out again. <laughs> you know, no, it's like... I, I, I get so used to buying everything on Amazon. They bring it right to my door. We just started doing groceries with right. the Sobeys Voila right yeah. to the door. I mean, really, what do I got to go out for? I don't really like people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like I, I feel like I've been in isolation for, for like, I think I've been in isolation for four years. Like, I think <laughs> since I left Koch and NE1 and I had to go to an office and I started my own company, I, I see people when I need to. I still do the ghost thing at every event. I'm doing fine in business. I'm busier than ever before. I still know everybody. I don't feel like I'm an old man yet. But <laughs> there's times when it's like, I can kind of get into this groove of taking the dogs out for a walk four times a day and, yeah, there's, there's definitely and, some and doing everything on email. I got my phone. I got my email. I got my computer. Yeah. Uh, other than talking to People like you every once in a while, like, I really don't need anybody else, to be honest <laughs> with you, except for my family and my, uh, my parents, obviously. I totally forgot what playing at gigs about anyway. So we, like right. so many musicians, we've, we've taken this time and we've spent uh, a lot of time really learning, you know, new skills, recording at home and all that. And it's, yeah. you know, it really, you know, it, I mean, listen, there's a lot of people that need the money and, and that's, that's crucial. Yeah. Um, but there's been a lot of other ways we filled that creative kind of need. And it's, yeah. it's been and, amazing. And, and nobody guaranteed anything. There wasn't anything in any rule book that said that the city of Toronto has to have 190 places where <laughs> you can do music. And I mean, and I don't mean that like, like, I, and then don't take that lightly, you know? No, no. Yeah. There, you know, there's, there, there's Spotify released this week, their internal, um, their internal financing when it comes to artists. And it turns out that 0 0.02 artists have made more than $45,000 a year. In I the, saw in that. The, you know, okay, that seems really low. But you know what the odds are of becoming a Major League Baseball player? Yeah, like, yeah. worse, or a hockey player, but yet parents still trot out their kid at 5 o'clock in the morning on the skating rink. So everybody is going for the brass ring you know yeah. yes i get it those weekend shows are done for the next year maybe until 2022 yeah. um nobody can really go on the road at a 25 percent capacity and still make money um so a lot of them are going to forego the touring until they can get back to really as close to 100 percent capacity or at least the ability to sell 100 percent tickets um but I, I and I get all that. I see it every single day. But again, like I'm sure people complained when the cassette tape moved from cassettes to CDs. There were people who were probably like, "Oh my God, now what do we do?" And it's like, well, you move with the times, and you, you, you know, you can't complain. I mean, you can complain, but who are you going to complain to? You might as well just try to figure out what what's working out there. And everything is still the same. You've got to be great. Your competition is not another band from your city. Your competition are still the Beatles and the Stones and the Who 
and Janis Joplin and Olivia Rodrigo for all the eyes and ears is everybody else out there. It, there's no different than that. Yeah, no, no, we're going to get into all that. I just want to refresh people here who don't know who you are. Oh, that's normally, tough. <laughs> normally my <laughs> they, channel... They haven't been shut off already. <laughs> my channel up to, up to this point has uh, been solely on uh, guitar players out of the Ontario area who've gone on and had some amazing careers. And I think that's, uh, that's how we connected because I was after one of your clients who's uh, doing some um, recording now and would like to just kind of hold off until until they can talk about that. And uh, that's how you showed up in my inbox. And yeah. uh, then the cool thing was the name jolted me, not because of your career, uh, which I should just throw out there. I mean, you're kind of one of the number one uh, PR guys out there in the industry. We'll get yeah. into all the awards and, and we're going to get into your bio. But, you know, you've done PR work for, for everybody. Let's just say that. Um, but the funny part is... Once I got past knowing who you were, I said, that name, that name. And then I remembered you're married <laughs> to, to, to Candace, who uh, when I was maybe three, four, my parents were friends with their parents, and yeah. we, were, we were at their house all the time. Your, your wife and, and my wife were good yes. friends. Yes, Brenda and Candace were, were childhood friends. So Now, I, what did you hear? No, I'm only kidding. I, don't want to... I, I really don't remember much. I just yeah. remember... Her father was kind of always on the cutting edge, you know, like he had the first Betamax and he had the first, <laughs> the first ColecoVision. He's going to yes, love that. He, yeah. he had a ColecoVision right. and he had a pinball machine in the house. So uh, it was cool. I'm sure that's why all the guys were over at Candace's house. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. That's right. Right. So um, you've been busy. Uh, well, you're always busy, but we were trying yeah. to connect to time and, um, you were busy a couple of weeks ago with the uh, Juno nomination. So the Juno's yeah. the 50th Juno is going to be yeah. out on May 16. Um, so tell us a little bit about, you know, some of uh, who are your clients that were nominated and, and what, what that week kind of means for you with regards to PR work. Yeah, normally I would be catching up on my sleep because Juno week is kind of nonstop for literally five or six days. But this is going to be a little bit different because everything is virtual. So they haven't revealed yet. Um, what is going to be seen by the general public. Um, there was talk that there might be doing um, a number of artist performances at various places around the city to highlight not only the city, but 50 years worth of Juno Awards. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if we go into another stage, then that might kind of put a wrench into it. But yeah, this year was, was pretty good again. Um, uh, have a, um, a, a number of, of artists that are nominated, um, including Kurt Diamond in the reggae category. Um, Crystal Shawanda got a couple of them. Um, so, you know, every year there's, there's always the usual amount, and I'm really lucky that way. But it's also a tad bit calculated that I never want to only work in the music industry with one set of group of artists. I don't want to work in all rock. I want to work in rock and world music and jazz and blues and R&B and, and hip hop and classical and instrumental and Celtic. I, I want to do it all. Um, so there's always a nice mix of, oh, here's a couple that got nominated in, you know, like Andy Milne in jazz and then also, you know, in reggae. And so I, I kind of love that. I, I love the, the variety of everything. And I've always done that working with, you know, people like the Wiggles and Ringo Starr and Guar all on the same day. It's like, that's awesome. Like where uh, the, the best life, you know, and it still is. I could see Ringo playing with Wiggles. Yeah, that well, would work. You know, as long as I don't get the interview requests mixed up, that for some reason somebody got to talk to the Wiggles instead of Guar, um, which that might not that might that might have been awesome actually. Could, probably, that would go viral. That would probably go viral. They're like, so do you define? You know, how do you define your love of Satan? Well, you know, <laughs> you know oh Judy, boy, you know. Toot, toot, yummy, yummy, you know, play it backwards. You never That's know. That's right. That's right. Uh, so you're a six-time nominee, publicist of the year for uh, Canadian Music Week and 16-time Juno Award winning for overseeing PR campaigns. So I'm just going to toot your horn here and just, I'm not going to list off that whole list that's on your website because it's ridiculous. But uh, let's go for the classic artists, a uh, short list of the classics that you've done work for. 
And then we'll, we'll get and have this all panned out for you and how you, how you met these people. But uh, Ringo Starr, Ray Charles, uh, Bob Geldof, Steve Miller, Carol King, Dr. John Dwight Yoakam, uh, slash Duran Duran. Okay, there's just a few <laughs> notables. Some Canadian greats, uh, household names of Canada rock, Kim Mitchell, Colin James, Bruce Coburn, Miles Goodwin, April Wine, and uh, Randy Bachman, so much more. And then I'll just end off with a few and that the, I and, picked and up. And all those people will be on your next show. Awesome. Oh, That's too awesome. Ba- yeah. Too bad for people <laughs> listening for this one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so getting to that, uh, I just I picked these names off and uh, that uh, I've interviewed. Um, and they were off on that list. Big Sugar, Gordy Johnson was my last interview. Jason Blaine, super nice guy. And Dana Manning, incredible yeah. talent. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, for uh, for a couple of months, it was that. And then with Jason Blaine, did a lot of singles. There were about two albums, and uh, he was kind of one of the forefronters of just releasing single after single after single after single yeah. um, when it came from the same album. And Gordy Johnson and Big Sugar, I've worked with for, for a number of years as well, and, and still do with the extended family where I do PR for True North Records, one of okay. Canada's oldest... Um, and longest running record labels, they do their vinyl distribution. So um, did a lot of work with them and uh, still keep in touch on, on social media with them. So yeah, great guys, great, yeah. great bunch of, of people. Excellent, excellent. So your first kind of big names that you started working with, with which really kicked things off and then we'll, we'll circle back, was uh, a band my, my mother used to love, the Nylons. So the Nylons, and then a band that nobody heard of at the time, uh, Nickelback. Yeah, and nobody still of, heard of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nobody knows the band, who they are. Everybody hates, but they've sold millions and millions of records. You started your own uh, kind of record company, and then uh, which led to a gig with with, with Shoreline uh, that had the Nylons, and and that kind of kicked things off. But it really started, which is really cool for Toronto. Um, with, with your grandfather who ran uh, Grossman's on Spadina. I think most people who watch this channel will know about Grossman's. We've, we've yeah. all spent a lot of time in there. Yeah. And, uh, a lot you know, of the time underage. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, actually, I, I moved to Toronto a little later, so I was, I was, okay. a, I was legit. But right, right. Uh, yeah, you got enamored with his record collection. So tell us, uh, tell us kind of about I did. that. It, it, was, it, was, it was everything, you know. Um, you know, for people who don't know the area that Grossman's is in, it's right across the street from Kensington Market, which is the hub of every ethnic group, every culture, every background, um, every color and creed and 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 wealth and and um, Grossman's was a place that you know was one of the first places that to actually have alcohol served with music, hmm. and the city of Toronto thought that the city would go to hell in a handbasket if, if, if blues music and, and alcohol mixed together. Uh, and they were right. And just look around us now. I mean, it, <laughs> it, it, you know, the prophecy is true. Um, but as a kid, whenever I used to go down to the bar, it was seeing people hang out and enjoy themselves and um, the food and the smoking and the drinking and the hooking up and the breaking up and the arguing and the the friendship. It was all there. And music to me was always a place for community. It was always a place where you can go. And the 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 music itself was more important to me than just sounds on the radio. It told me the stories of what was happening racially and to the economy and sociology the the grooves of those records taught me about life and and how to live it and how not to live it and um so when i when i was a kid it was all i wanted to do was somehow be in music and i knew i couldn't play my whole life i i still cannot play a single instrument um or or do anything in music so did you try i mean was there i did i was in a I was in I was in the the world's worst cover band with some of the greatest people that this city has ever been in with Hayden um, and Howie Beck, um, who's a major producer, and I had a drum kit that was made up of literally nine different other drum kits, and um, I was awful. I was horrible. I was counting in my head one two three four one two three four. Like I had no feel 
Yeah. Uh, um, but I knew so just that a if love. I want, you just you just had a love for music, but you couldn't yeah, play it, and you had to figure I something out. So. I had to figure yeah. something out, and yeah. so you know, reading Billboard magazine as a teenager, it was like, whoa, who are these people? Like, mm. what? Who are the record labels and the distributors and managers and booking agents and publishers, and what do they do? And and I, and it just kind of did my own research before you know before there was an internet of just trying to find out, and and I you know. I stunk at the beginning, like everybody else did. You know, you just try to find what you think that you love and worked at at the campus radio station at York and then started the record label, then a book uh, booking agency, then a publicist. And then I got the job at Shoreline, um, which, yeah, then had like Patricia Conroy and the Nylons and Nickelback. And then <laughs> we changed distributors and we went to Koch. And then a year, about a year after that, the president of Koch said, do you want to work 160 artists instead of working the three? And it was my dream to work at Smithsonian Folkways. I love that label. I love right, right. the gravitas of that label. I love the importance of that label. And they distributed Smithsonian. And I was like, yeah, like amazing. Because all their labels were American based. Hmm. And those labels didn't care about Canada. We were 3% of the world market yeah. to them. Still are. So <laughs> I did all the publicity for all those artists and all those labels. Oh. That's cool. Hey, on uh, on the Grossman side, uh, I'm sure you're aware of this guy. You probably saw him many times when you were young, uh, Danny Marks. And yeah. I, I saw on his Facebook, I mean, I guess there's been a producer that's been in and out, um, kind of working with him to put a documentary together on uh, Grossman's Tavern. Yeah. You, you hear anything on that? Yeah, there's a couple of them that are out there. One of them is from a former CBC producer who I've been talking to okay, off and on cool. for a couple of years. Um, there's always one going on. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's that's normal. I think every city has people who want to... Um, you know, preserve the history when it comes to the arts. I mean, Canada itself is a horrible country when it comes to protecting our our yeah. history. We we don't do it well. Right. Um, and you know, I mean, we're we're finally going to see a documentary on Yorkville, um, and it should be right up there with with Greenwood Village and and yeah. and Haight Ashbury when it comes to the cultural and musical importance of what that area meant for under a decade yeah, yeah, yeah but still completely changed the way how the city of toronto and thus canada ruled when it came to entertainment so from shoreline you you went to Koch, and uh i had to look it up uh because mm. i couldn't remember some of the names but it was pretty cool like uh, Koch entertainment like you said you were um they were originally a big uh, German kind of folk music di yeah. distributor, which kind of went with that label that you were enamored with. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the history of it was, I looked that up back in 95, uh, they came to Canada, and then they sold, uh, they got sold off to uh, Entertainment One, which was yeah. originally a record on wheels. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that. There's only, there's, there's only one company in the world, and it's all <laughs> it's all owned by yeah four thousand different people. Yeah, by Hasbro. Ha Right. Yeah. Crazy, right? Yeah. So now Hasbro owns the Death Row catalog. Yeah, it's it's hilarious. I read that. Like they paid four million dollars for Entertainment One, which was originally Records on Wheels and Koch Yeah, and, it's yeah. it's one of those things where yeah, like everything kind of evolves and, and Koch was a distributor. I mean, all of their day to day, everybody there was concerned with getting as many records into the store as possible. And my job was to help move them out. And That's they awesome. did marketing and they did a lot of sales. Um, but it was, it was amazing. It was just, you know, working like those artists and then like, you know, stabbing Westward and the Death Row catalog and so much hip hop, like the Stones Throw with Mad Lib and, and MF Doom. Um, that's how I got to work with Ray Charles and Ringo Starr and Sinead O'Connor. And, and um, I, I could have never gotten that experience um, working for a record label. Yeah. Tell me about your, I mean, Ray Charles is like number one to me. I mean, that's, he's like God. I mean, uh, and I'm a guitar player, but it doesn't matter. He's just incredible. Right. So what, 
what were you working on? How did that happen for you? And you know, what yeah. did you do? <laughs> so we were we were distributing Concord Records, which is one one of the big jazz labels, and they were working on the Genius Loves Company album that ended up sweeping the Grammy Awards. And I started working with them maybe about a year before his passing away, just basically oh, wow. collecting all of the details for the EPK and and hanging out and talking to his people. And then um, I've met him a couple of times before. For that really really briefly but then when that album came out um it was it was i think at the time probably around the biggest selling album in our history we just sold just under three hundred thousand copies in canada um it was the first independent one of the first independents ever debut at number one on the billboard chart and also on uh, on the canadian chart as well so that that album is truly special because i i think it it's it's hard to say something like he would have been a legend if that album came out and he was still alive because he already was. Oh, of course. But I think that we would have just been able to see just how amazingly powerful his music truly was. And instead, <laughs> yeah. we had to do that without him being yeah. around. But yeah. all those people on the record did a fine job from Nora Jones onward, so it was great. That's amazing. I mean, uh, listen, your career has been fascinating, but it, it, you must, it, you got to pinch yourself when you're, you know, oh, every meeting day. Ringo Starr, oh, uh, every Bob Geldof, or like, uh, <laughs> every I mean, day, <laughs> every day. I bought all, see, what people have to understand, I bought all those records growing yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, so for me to drive around in a car hanging out with Bob Geldof, the first thing I want to tell him is, I woke up at four o'clock in the morning to watch Live Aid. Like <laughs> yeah, you, you directly affected my life. Or yeah. you know, being with Sinead O'Connor for really? you know a couple of days every every couple of years was just like, wow. I bought I do not want what I haven't got and the Lion and the Cobra and all your stuff. Like these people yeah. truly touched my life. But there's always that like eighty percent of me is like you know fanboy, and then the other part twenty percent is like let's get down to work until it's. And then you just have to kind of do the work and just, and then ask for that autograph drum head later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you did ask for the autographs, right? Oh my God, yeah. Well, yeah. for sure. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, you, you know what? Like, I, I, I used to do that all the time with my vinyl records, was get people signed. I used to line up outside of the record man, HMV, whenever people were in town and stuff. And then I saw Noel Gallagher from Oasis say like something like you know that's the stupidest thing i've ever heard why does somebody want my autograph like it's just it's just ink <laughs> on something that i ruined it uh, and why cool. does anybody want my selfie i don't know who you are you know and so since then i kind of thought yeah you know that's kind of yeah. kind of weird there's something about autographs of, of, of heroes once they passed on you know you can't see in my room but on the yeah. other side um there was a fella who was uh big into concert photography who he passed away a few years ago um, and he was going through rough times and he posted, he had a whole bunch of records and they were all signed. And I went over there and I, I got quite a few and I ended up framing them really nicely. Like I got Joe. Oh, Cock that's great. I'm looking at Joe Cocker's album there. And yeah. Like little feet signed by, you know, well, most of them are all gone now, you know, and it's, uh, the righteous right. brothers, what else? Everly brothers. I got over there, you know, so it's, it's amazing just it's to nice. stare at these. It's things. like you're yeah. a little rock and roll hall of fame museum. Yeah, exactly. So out of all these names and and I, you know, obviously a lot of them probably came through that work with uh, with Koch uh, just cuz they represented so many labels. Is there a standout uh, a killer story that you can share with us? Since I was 12, I have love tears for fears. And I still do. Oh, yeah. uh, they're they're not even my guilty pleasure. They are because I don't believe in that. They're, they're still a, an, a band that I think is just over the moon amazing. And so when I got to do the BR for Kurt Smith and then a couple of Tears for Fear shows and hung out and got to have Roland on my own show for the hour. Oh, cool. Um, I got to ask him all the geeky questions I would never ask anybody. All the things that only I needed to know about. Um, but, you know, something like Sinead O'Connor was, was amazing and funny. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a time when um, you know, she was still, you know, people, people not only revered her, but were scared of her because she was so powerful and, and, and you never quite knew where, 
where she was going to go and she didn't care about what you had to say <laughs> but i think deep down inside what we realize is that everybody yeah. does and yeah and um um so she was she was just funny i mean there was there was a time when it was like you know we 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 were she did, was doing a show at Massey Hall in Toronto and we were going across the street to France and and they had a little bit of a wait for a table and you know it, it's Shane O'Connor and the the <laughs> band that had been waiting outside know that she's in there so I said to the to the waiter like hey is there is there anything you know that we can do because this is you know it's for Sinead O'Connor and he said oh I, I don't like Sinead O'Connor I don't I don't like her and, and she's right in front of me. And, uh, and she said, oh, it's okay. You know, there are days where I don't like myself either. And stuff. And <laughs> probably got a seat. Is this, but yeah, uh, you know, people like Ringo Starr is exactly how you would think Ringo Starr is. Just, yeah. you know, as serious when he wants to be. But other than that, he's just, you know, the happiest drummer that ever lived. And drummers so, are already loopy to begin with. Did you do that whole thing? You know, what was his name there? The big comedian. He was on Saturday Live with uh, Paul McCartney. He was like, uh, "So y y you know, you were in the Beatles." <laughs> Remember when you were with the Beatles? <laughs> right, Something right, like that, right. Yeah. I, I, I had those. I had those moments. Oh, yeah, yeah, you had that, the opportunity. <laughs> no, yeah, no. You're just looking at them, going like, like "There's, there's only two of you." Yeah, like, <laughs> like, like holy cow. there's, there's nothing that. I mean, you, you know you get into these moments with people where it's like, I know more about you than you do yeah, yeah. because you've seemingly have forgotten a lot of things because <laughs> yeah, you were right. actually there. Yeah. But I remember them or at least I read about them or people yeah, told yeah. me about them. So those are, those are, are wonderful. Yeah. Every day, every awesome. day is, is, is an awesome day because well, I get for to you. work this. Yeah. I take very with, fast showers because I just can't wait to yeah, start working. Yeah, you don't want to miss something. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's it's fascinating, you know, somebody who's got the love for music but yet's not playing it, you know, and how you could just turn that love into a, an incredible career that's, you know, gone. But I, think, I think most people, you know, kind of want to do that. And, um, and I know I was one of the lucky ones, but it was also yeah. taking a look at various people that were in my life, whether it was my family who you know, maybe didn't get to do what they wanted to do and others that did. And it was like every day that, I mean, it wasn't like all of a sudden, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of hard work. <laughs> there's a I'm lot. Sure. There's like, <laughs> eight, you know, I'm still working, you know, 16, 17 hour days, yeah. seven days a wow. week, even before the pandemic. But even back then when I was first starting out, I was working with really indie bands that had no right to have a publicist. <laughs> but I was affordable and I wanted to do, and I wanted to work with them because I wanted to make my mistakes and, you know, eating craft dinner for, you know, three meals a day um, was amazing because it was a day that I didn't have to do anything I didn't want to do, yeah. but it wasn't like, you know, when, when people want to do something that seems fun to the outside world, yeah you almost have to work that much harder because there's so many people who want to do that. Like sure, even sure, now today, yeah. there's still, you know, in Ontario, like 16,000 people every year that graduate with public relations. It's sure. like, oh, we're really? all fighting for the same attention yeah, yeah. with the newspapers and well, everything else, you know? Well, the big one is uh, during this pandemic, I think Spotify gets like 50,000 uploads a day. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> talk about competition. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. That's, that's ridiculous. So, you know, you, you started way before social media. I mean, you were you were around, just like you said, you were probably kicking around. I was using a fax machine. Yeah, you were a horseshoe or lease balance or whatever. And, uh, you know, cassettes in an envelope running to the post office. And now we've got 10 second uh, lip sync videos on TikTok. So yeah. you've seen it all and you've been through it. So take us through that. Let's go back a little in history and take us through that change when, when social media just kind of got started and, and what that meant for you and your business. It was a joke. I mean, nobody, nobody knew what it was. It, it was all still traditional of phone, pick up the phone, call somebody. You know, I didn't even have a beeper until 1999, until like maybe a couple of years before I got really started with it. But, uh, but it was... Um, it, it was very still traditional. You know, we went to see people in the media. We dropped off vinyl records at dance 
pools and 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 things like that. When social media came on, I got on MySpace really, really, early, really late compared to everybody else. It was almost on the way out. And then I got on Facebook and quickly reached 5,000 friends fast. And it mm-hmm. wasn't because I knew that many people because I still don't. I still only know four people in real life, you know. Um, but it seemed like the the artists realized that they could now reach people that worked in the music industry, specifically with artists. Um, it also meant that book writers can reach out to people who worked in book publishing and, and radio and everything like that as well. So I, when I got on Facebook, um, it, it became, it, it, it wasn't anything more, and still isn't, anything more than a tool for me to blab away about the things that I love and the things I was working. And it wasn't all about the things I was working. You know, it, even during my space, I still promoted and talked about and mentioned and posted 85% of the stuff had nothing to do with my company or mm-hmm. the label I was working at. Um, and I was really lucky that way because if early on people bigger than me would have said, Hey, dude, what are you doing promoting Sony's artists or whoever? It probably, I, you and I probably aren't talking right now because then everything changes. But because mm-hmm. I got to play both sides of it, I got to be a fan talking about artists and media and music in the media and on social media. Um, while working in the industry, it got me to this whole thing of, mm-hmm. of being able to post what I want to post when I want to post it, however many times I do. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that my job changed so much. I still don't like social media in terms of doing business. I will always tell everybody to always email me. I'm really old school that way. Mm. Um, uh, You know, I don't reach out to people in the media for interview requests or opportunities, sending them direct messages. There's just something about that that never never sat well with me. Um, Mm. But I still get hit up by hundreds of bands every single week looking to be on a playlist or to be on the radio show. And that's okay. I'll just kind of take that stuff and go, let me just kind of step back a little bit. But, you know, when I got on Facebook, it was great. When I got on Twitter was really early on in Twitter when it just seemed like the only people that were on there were like social media gurus and mompreneurs. Mm-hmm. And, and we were doing Twitter parties every single night and doing giveaways and working with brands and stuff like that. And uh, that quickly led to Instagram and now TikTok. So, you know, I, I know where my audience is. I know exact. I think I know exactly who they are when it comes to social media. Doesn't necessarily mean I want to play in that field. I'll still post about Drake and hip hop and rap on Twitter, knowing full well that I will get six retweets. And knowing full well that when I post the picture of Led Zeppelin, I'll get 4,000 likes on it. I know that. Mm -hmm. But social media for me is a place where I can have fun and get all the crap out of my brain (laughs) onto somewhere else that makes my wife really happy that I don't bother her with this stuff anymore. So Twitter is, that's your, that's your home, right? Uh it is, but it, you know, people were like, oh, you know, you don't engage. It's like, who cares if I don't engage? You're here (laughs) for my entertainment too. Yeah. You know, people don't realize that is like, uh, you know, you don't answer your own question. Nobody needs to know what I have to think. Nobody <laughs> needs to know about my dogs or my daughter unless, or my wife or my personal life, unless I want them to, because it's a cesspool of anger out there too. I'm fully aware of that. So I tend to just want to place everybody else. I'll be honest with you. I literally just kind of reopened my uh, um, Twitter account just uh, the other day so I could uh, see what you're up to. So uh yeah, it, what do you, you post like every uh, every thirty seconds or something. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a yeah, lot of well, you know. I, I'm only following three people right now, and you're one. So yeah, I guess maybe that's right. why I see a lot of you. Right. But uh, you got what like a million yeah. followers? One million dollars across like a, all the social media stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's yeah, great. It, so, there's, there's much, yeah, between like between like six hundred fifty thousand, seven hundred thousand or so on Twitter, and then the two Facebook pages. I've got a fan page because, you know, I, I hit that 5,000 friend mark. So yeah. um, people just kept adding it to there. And then LinkedIn and Instagram and TikTok. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's over a million for sure, which which freaks me out. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it would. Um, 
I mean, I th- it a lot should. of people, it, my God, like, yeah, now, and then now four hours before we're talking, you know, Christy Teigen leaves is the next one to leave Twitter because she can't handle the trolls and the anger. It's like, <laughs> I feel you, you know, all it takes is for like one, you know, look, I'll, I'll tweet something about some song that I love and invariably somebody will say, you suck. And it's like, <laughs> thanks for ruining my day. You know, I still feel that. Is it smart for people to kind of rework their way they're working with social media? Because it, to me, you know, the Facebook, it, it got so big that it, it's very hard to get any attraction on pages. That, that's what I find. Yeah. Well, I mean, people have to understand where all of this is coming from. Because in the beginning, every single social media site is free. Mm-hmm. Until you realize that they just changed the algorithm because now you're the product that's being yeah. sold. And um, when, you're, when you have the ability to know your audience, that's really the secret sauce of it all. If you're, if you're 45, if, if you're an artist between the ages of 45 and 65 and you play blues music, your audience is on Facebook. Mm-hmm. If, you know, because nobody wants to go on the social media site that came before them. Mm-hmm. So if you follow the steps of MySpace to Facebook to Twitter to Instagram to to TikTok. When I first got on Facebook, I was the first generation to be on Facebook. Right. And then we all went to Twitter. And then hmm. smatterings to Instagram. Definitely most people are not on TikTok. Mm-hmm. But my daughter, who's 18, her first social media network was Twitter. So she definitely went to Instagram, definitely on TikTok might be on Facebook, might, Mm -hmm. but she knows that her parents are on Facebook. Right, right. right. So when she wrote her book, Facebook was a really big area of promotion for her because there weren't a lot of eight to 15 year olds who had money to buy a book. So we had to reach the parents. So, you know, it all depends on what kind of music you play. If you're like a 16 year old pop singer, it's all on TikTok and Instagram, never on Twitter, absolutely not on Facebook, unless you want to reach the parents of the right. kids who you want to go on. So the yeah. more that you know, but yeah, you know, I, I, I deal with this every day with questions from artists of like, you know, I've got, I've got a thousand fans on Facebook, but I only have six engagements. And it's like, yeah. Cause you got to spend the money, yeah. you know, for every dollar you spend, you'll reach a hundred people or so. And yeah. now Facebook wants you to spend that money on it, but they're out there. And the best thing about it is that they are out there. You know, if you're yeah. a folk band from Chicago who loves Wilco, go find those people who love Wilco, who are yeah. from your age demographic, who live in Illinois, you can reach them for $4. You know, yeah, it's amazing yeah, yeah. rather than, you know, and no offense to any traditional magazine, but like, you know, you, you have to buy a full page ad in whatever magazine, Billboard or Rolling Stone or Spin, and you never know who was reading that. It could be somebody who likes Duran Duran. It could be somebody who likes Buddy Guy. Mm-hmm. At least you can kind of narrow down the scope of things, which is amazing. It's the best thing that ever happened, I think, to music in a long time is that you can actually reach the people who would enjoy your music the most really cheaply now. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 all very fascinating. So, back to your career as a as a PR guy. Well, I guess we never left that. But what stage in the game uh, should an artist be at? in order to consider hiring a PR person? Um, I I think if you were to ask any other publicist, they would probably give you a standard answer of, well, you know, you have to build a momentum and you have to have a bio and you have to have, you know, pretty great photos and and build up your momentum and have at least an album or two under your belt. Um, I... I, I've got artists that this is their very first single that they've ever recorded in their entire lives. And I think they're great. I think because to me, it's not a question of what have you done? It's a question of what's out there for you that I think I can get for you. Hmm. And I would never guarantee anything. And I would never tell them specific things. But I do know where people are around the world that if, if you're just, you know, if you're part of the BIPOC community, if you're an indigenous rock band, there's a spot for you that maybe five years ago wasn't available, you know, seemingly in the opposite. If you're, you know, if you're in your fifties and you're all white and you're playing rock and roll and you're first starting out, maybe the media is going to ignore you a little bit more because you had your time for, Oh, 200 years, you know? So for me as a publicist, it's, it's, 
a question of I'm not going to go out to entertainment tonight or eTalk or the Toronto Star every single time right off the bat. But there's a lot that can be had and gotten and and listened to, even if it is cool feedback for artists that are just starting out. And I know what everybody else charges. Right, right. And I know I'm more affordable than they are for <laughs> For Still, a very eh? good. Well, yeah, because oh, I don't, I don't want to. I never want my to limit my happiness. <laughs> to be honest with you, because I have fun and a grand old time working with brand new artists than I do with working with veteran heritage artists that can actually afford, you know, a hot publicist out of LA, it's like, I'll still charge you the same amount of what I'm charging an indie artist. <laughs> so to me, it's, it's, again, it's like, I have to love it. And if I think I love it, and I think that there's a story there for the media to latch onto, let's go. So for a newer artist, even one that's been around for a while, uh, you know, when you start working with them, what's kind of like the first thing that you want them to do? And what would be kind of like the first main thing that you would do for them? Um, you know, I, after I, I kind of checked them out a little bit on social media, because I want to make sure just how, how active they are. Um, and it's okay if they're not, but I need to know that heading into it because really the media, um, along with serving the needs of their community and, and kind of working on stories that, that they think are important to be told, um, they still need to stay in business and they get to stay in business by having more and more people visit their website or visit their socials. So the first thing that I need for them to understand is that they're going to be sharing everything when I get them right. because they, they need to know it's a two way street and that they need to know that there needs to be a story there for them to write 500 words about the, about you as an artist, or at least talk to you for 15 minutes about, I need to figure out what kind of a person they are. Are they shy? Are they shy because nobody's really asked them anything and then now they're just kind of opening up and blossoming like a flower or can they just talk nonstop for four hours and maybe I just need to kind of temper or get them to focus a little bit on the three things that they need to just get across. So for me, it's about kind of them as people first. And then mm -hmm. I figure out on the musical side, you know, there's, there's still some photos where it was taken on an iPhone and it's good enough for, for most people that are out there. Again, it may not be great for Rolling Stone magazine and it's certainly not, but that's okay. That'll, you know, you get Rolling Stone magazine. We'll, we'll, we'll figure all that stuff out, you yeah, know, yeah. in the process of that. Streaming, which everybody, you know, there's all the pros and cons and a lot of negativity to hear these days is, is the payouts and all that. But we were kind of just addressing the volume. So, uh, you know, I, I mentioned, the stats during this pandemic was like 50,000 uploads a day. So is it kind of something, your responsibility or, or your role when you're working for an artist to help them when they have a new release to somehow navigate through all that to, to break through? Yeah. Um, about 10 years ago when everybody had blogs um, before streaming services happened, they were just basically embedding wherever your MP3 or WAV file or music was. Um, right. Right. And then SoundCloud came along and mm -hmm. people were embedding that. And then people were doing a lot of remixes of those songs, regardless of whatever kind of style of music, because it was a kind of free for all. You didn't really need to have the rights in order to do a remix. Um, and then, you know, as music streaming got bigger and bigger, there was a, a whole industry on the Spotify playlist mm -hmm. that a lot of these blogs then started their own playlist in order to make money. And they would go on third party sites like submit hub or groover or human human where artists and record labels and publicists pay to get the music heard by these bloggers because there was so much out there hmm. that it was almost impossible to find the good ones when you have to sift through 250 press releases a day yeah. now i get average maybe 600 press releases on Friday for New Music Friday, maybe 400 every single day of the week. Wow. And that's just for the radio show and what I do. I can only imagine what a pitchfork gets in the thousands every single week. So wow. 
these third party sites kept popping up that they were kind of like, Hey, if you want to reach the blogs, here you go. And that created yeah. a whole industry of <laughs> Spotify playlister companies and Spotify promoters that would go around and literally either buy up as many Spotify playlists as possible, flip oh, them yeah. for their own use, yeah. or that they would create their own and buy a whole bunch of bots and kind of smoke and mirror people into thinking that these were all legit. So where I kind of fit into all of that is like the people who I knew that used to be bloggers or that still have a blog, but they also still have a Spotify playlist. Um, I'm still reaching out to them and I don't care what I'm going after really, whether it's a, I don't care what they give whether it's just spot on the playlist or whether it's a review or even a rehashing of the press release. I I'm good with everything. Cause I know, I know how, how, how slammed they are and how sometimes little money they make and they are still doing it for the love of it. So I'm still kind of involved with, with, with that because in Canada, weirdly enough, we've always been very behind, you know, a step or two when it comes to new technology. We were mm -hmm. one of the last countries in the first world to get a, an iPhone. Um, there's still a lot of places in Canada that still don't have high speed internet that should. Um, when it came to Spotify playlisters, a lot of them are still connected to something more traditional in the media or that they already work in the industry or that mm -hmm. they're freelancers from the other world five years ago. So I'm still in touch with a lot of these people on a regular basis anyway. Hmm. Probably one of the benefits of your role to, a, to an artist, uh, regardless of what your fee is, you can help them st stick handle through all that and, you know, avoid them wasting money, you know, cause there's, there's just yeah. a plethora yeah. of people selling how to get on this, how to get your song played on this, da, 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 da. you know, and, and, a, and a lot of artists, we, we fall for it, right? Because it's our dreams, you know, and, and this guy's got the magic sauce to get us there, you know, but, but somebody yeah. who's been in the business for 25 plus years, kind of knows what's bullshit and what works. Yeah, and, and those, those things are still correct. You know, if you were to Google how to write a press release, they're all, they're all fine. Mm -hmm. But this, what, what makes it different is the flowery words that you get to <laughs> use and, and the, the knowledge to put it in context where, um, where maybe other artists won't be able to do that. I mean, it's okay to still have those dreams. Look, there, there's an artist that I'm working with that, you know, asks about getting in Rolling Stone and the source. And it's like, this is your second single and you're still under a thousand streams. Yeah. But they see people coming out of nowhere in their eyes and they want that too. But they don't understand that that person is managed by that person who also manages Justin Bieber, yeah. or, you know, he's already signed to Universal, the biggest record label in the world. They just haven't released that information yet. Right. So a lot of the times, yeah, we're selling, I mean, the industry itself loves to sell dreams. Sure. I'm kind of, I'm still an optimist because why you have not to you? Be. You have yeah, to be. Yeah, <laughs> why not you? Somebody's got to do it. Who's going to hire it. you if, they, if you tell them, forget it, forget it, go back to well, school? <laughs> but, there, but there are people that are like that, that would be yeah. like, look, you're going you're gonna to pay me $5,000 a month, minimum a year, so we can build. And it's yeah, like, yeah. who's got time to build? I get that. I get that. You know, like, yeah. I don't want to knock those people. And I know we're, you know, you can't just lay out a brand new artist. There's a method to this madness. But mm -hmm. a lot of these artists are okay with going for the world right now and kind of falling a little bit. And, and if I'm the sure. one that needs to bring them back down to earth, I'll show them the proof yeah. rather than no. I would never tell anybody no. It's almost like, well... This is kind of what's out there right now, but I'm happy to pitch them. Nobody tells you anymore why it's a no. There's no time for it. They don't have entertainment tonight or e talk has no time to write back to 6,000 people a week. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. And the reason why, <laughs> when they want something, they'll be more than happy to respond back to the email saying, I'm in. Well, yeah, it's, it, the volume, you know, with the do-it-yourself, recording at home, the whole industry has really changed. I mean, you know, you were there kind of in the early days when when labels 
you know, early days of rock and roll in the well, 1940s. We're not, there we we're, go. We're not that old, but yeah. the, the point is, is when we were growing up, the labels kind of dictated what we're going to listen to and when, yeah. you know, so you knew exactly, like I can remember. Everybody dictated that to you. Yeah. Much music did. MTV did. The radio exactly. station did. Yeah. You had no choice. So there was only so much out at a certain time. Like, and that's why we can remember like the exact moment I heard scenes from Italian restaurant from Billy Joel. Like I can remember that. I yeah. can remember exactly when I realized Steely Dan wasn't a guy, you know, Right, right. You know, these things in our life. We, but, but nowadays, great artists coming out. Like, I'm a huge, I'm a country fan. So I really like, like the band Midland. But yeah. my memory 20 years from now is, oh, yeah, I discovered Midland. Somebody messaged me a video on Facebook, and I clicked it while I was right. kind of laying in bed staring at my yeah. iPhone. You know, that's there's not no, the same. <laughs> there's, there's no emotional context to anything yeah, yeah. anymore, you know? Like... You know, it, you know, I've, I've, I've talked about this. I'm sure people like you have thought about this. It was like you had to go and save your money and then go take a bus yeah, and yeah. go downtown, the <laughs> scary place of downtown to some people. You have to hope, hope that the record store had whatever you wanted because seemingly there was only 3,000 records in that whole thing. And, and it seemed like, you know, 20% of them or whatever was selling that week from ACDC or, or whoever else. Um, you had to go home, take off the wrapper, put it on a player that you had to spend extra money for, whether it was a Walkman or a record player or whatever. And that was it. You listened to that album for weeks because yeah, yeah. you couldn't afford anything else. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, whereas, you know, when I have my playlist and I, you know, or when I go through the new release list on Friday, there are 75 albums I want to listen to. I'll listen to everything as much as I can, at least once. But there's probably wicked albums that I've deleted off of my Spotify, you know, playlist that I never gave a chance to. Yeah. That yeah. I would have probably never been able to buy back then either. But there, you know, I, you know, and, and I know I'm going to sound old saying this, but <laughs> I, I honestly believe that this is true. You know, the reason why I can. The reason why I'm happy to post about all different kinds of music on social media is really because of the era that I grew up in. That looking back on it, I just assumed that if it got to me as a kid, as a teenager, as mm. a young adult, it was great. Mm -hmm. I, may, I might not have enjoyed Hootie and the Blowfish as much as some people. I dug them. I never bought the record. Mm -hmm. But man, did I have a lot of respect for it because I understood, not just because I was in the industry, but I understood that every band in America wants to get signed to a major label, and this band did. And, you know, Warner, Universal, Sony, the three big major yeah. labels, when they release something, there's probably 60 to 100 artists that are working on dozens and dozens and dozens of songs behind the scenes to get to that one perfect song to even be released. Oh yeah. Back then, every state had its own A and R guy or woman, and there were so many hip and cool record labels that by the time that it got on the radio, you just assumed that that was the greatest thing that you had yeah. to listen to. Yeah, and for the yeah. most part, they were right. Now yeah. there's six thousand songs over a million streams on Spotify. Is that a lot? <laughs> I don't know. Seems like a lot, but not really. If 6,000 people can do that. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's all that, you know? So when I listen to things now, I wish I could be more enthusiastic yeah, for it's tough. It's tough. what people are listening to a lot. It's not for me. And that's yeah. okay. Yeah. I get it. I kind of see what, what, why they like it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to listen to this for a year. Like I used to segues into my next little topic, which in a way is the future possibly, but it's kind of going back in time. So I'm going to talk about crypto currencies in the sense of these NFTs, these non fungible tokens, which is kind of the, the new craze. And I think what they're trying to do is go back in time. So what we, what we were just chatting with was, you know, back in the old days, you'd press 
whatever, 100,000 albums for a release. And when the 100,000 albums sold out, that was it. You couldn't get one, you know, unless you had a cassette player and you recorded it off somebody's stereo, but you would have to wait till another pressing. You know, yeah. and, then, and then, you know, we evolved. Uh, technology, we had CDs, then we had the Napster, and then everything got digital, and then we go to streaming. And so we've gone to this extreme where everybody's complaining because there's so little money in it because it's almost everything is kind of anything digital is almost free. So yeah. these, these NFTs in a sense are trying to somewhat fix that by um, making digital property authentic. And there's, it started a little bit in the art world, but there's some talk about it that we could actually apply these NFTs. We can kind of take theoretically a new song release and limit the supply digitally. So where do you think, is this real? Is this gonna work? Is this the future? I hope not. <laughs> and I don't think people want to do that. I, I, if you have to explain how to consume something, the average person on the street cannot comprehend any of that. You know, the problem, so, when Kings of Leon a couple of weeks ago released right. their album as an NFT and also gave like NFT in the style of like golden tickets where, you know, for life, you and three friends would get to go front row tickets to your hometown concert for life, have a butler, have a roadie, yeah, have yeah. all these, all these things. Um, it was, it was like just, you know, when I was doing media, cause everybody, a lot of people in the media called me up and said, could you explain it? It's like, kind of, yeah. So it was, it was kind of like an auction um, and there was limited supplies. But the best thing about it from an artist's perspective was that because it's crypto, if that person who bought it or you know, got the highest bid for it decided to sell it somewhere down the road, that artist still makes money. Yeah. You know, they can dictate 10% for life. So if I bought that Hootie and the Blowfish album from Sam the Record Man and then five years later give it to the record store, sell it to the record store, you know, a used record store for four dollars, Hootie and the Blowfish does not make any money off of that. You can do that with books when you go mm -hmm. get sure. rid of books and you sell them back to the bookstore. Um, this would ultimately change all of that, meaning that forever you are getting paid for that song, yeah. which is amazing. Love that idea of it. Yeah. But I think the limited part of it only um, it only separates the true fans or the people with money with the people who really make your career, which is the general public. Mm -hmm. If you can reach people like my mother and father with your music, you're big. Because those people listen to the radio for 15 minutes a week. And if they know who you are, you've seeped into the culture. Yeah. That's where you yeah. become legendary. Yeah. When you're worrying about, and look, and that's not to say that artists like, you know, Kings of Leon or Grimes can't make $26 million a year selling it, you know, their artwork to six people. Amazing. But you don't have a long lasting career without the middle, the, 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 the gooey caramel in a caramel bar is really super important, you know, um, not everybody can have the Mona Lisa, but people get to see it whenever they want to, at least online. They can, buy a, they can buy a postcard. They can do that. But you still need the general population to be able to want to be a part of whatever you're yeah. working on in terms of your art. I think I, optimistically for me, because I, I, I've kind of dived deep into it in the last couple of weeks trying to, yeah. trying to get it. And, and optimistically, I see it. Well, I mean, it's got a lot more to develop. Like you said, it, it, it's not easy to participate in now. You, Do you believe that the world economy one day is going to just crash and crypto is going to be, and Bitcoin is going to be somewhere down the road, the next worldwide currency to just, because I have a friend who absolutely believes in that, enticed me to buy into Bitcoin. Sure. And I did. Oh, good for you. I don't believe that the economy is going to crash, but yeah. you know what? Who's again, going back to the whole beginning of the conversation, there was nothing that was guaranteed that we were all going to have different color money. Yeah. 
you know, yeah. and that why is the United States worth more than the Canadian one? I don't know. Can you figure it out? Probably. Can you explain <laughs> to my parent? No. Yeah, yeah. But still, we we live in that world. Why would cryptocurrency be any harder for them to understand? It probably wouldn't. I just want to go back to your point of, you know, acceptability. So the president, the, the premise. I don't have of, a point. I just fly <laughs> by. Well, I was just I saying the, the premise of these MST and NFTs, it, it's a blockchain on Ethereum. So you would need the, their currency, which is either, which is just another form of, of Bitcoin. So that's going to take a while to develop because obviously there's, there's only so many people who are in this space. But yeah. Play this out with me, because I kind of thought this and I wanted to share it with you. Yeah. So the, the, the thing that I understand about these NFTs is they have what's called a smart contract. So you can put the rules, embed them digitally into yeah. the NFT. So possibly, instead of selling NFTs for whatever, this, this artwork that we see for a million dollars and all that, an artist could release their songs as NFTs and people could stream it, and the contract would send the money directly to 50% Sony, 50% Hootie and the Blowfish, right? To use your right. example. Immediately. Immediately. You get your, yeah, you which get is amazing. So take Not Spotify. Not six months or a year down the road, yeah. Take Spotify, 10 bucks a month, right? That's about the average yep. cost. Yep. I Googled the average amount of time, you're probably a lot more, but the average amount of time somebody spends on Spotify is 25 hours a month, which equates on the payout that they roughly do to artists about three cents a stream, a point three cents a stream would be about two dollars. So the average customer is only using about two dollars worth of their subscription. Yeah. So if an artist tripled that amount, let's say to a penny, the, the consumer could probably spend less than ten dollars a month. And the artists would be getting substantially more. So I see the future that we've, we've been so fed up with giving digital content away for free that we're going to have this circle. Well, we're not going to have albums have come back, but it's not going to come back to the masses. Yeah, but never but we're taking that digital thing that's been streamed for free, and now we're going to like kind of solidify it a little bit and make it worth something. And I, I think that could be amazing. And I think it's going to take a little bit of time, but we're the same age. Remember in 93 or 94 when, when the internet started blasting off, a lot of people had no clue what the hell that was. No, it used to take <laughs> you like five hours to download a photo. Yeah. You so, know, um, I don't yes, know. You're, in theory, that's exactly what I think the enthusiasts want to see happen. Yeah. I hope the artists want that too. What is going to be astounding is getting everybody in the free world to pay the same with the same currency everywhere. Now, what mm -hmm. the, 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 the problem with it now is that that 0 0.004 cents per stream that the, art, that the rights holders get right. are divided up between the mm -hmm. publisher and the rights holder and the record label and the manager and the lawyer and the uh, yeah. trickled all the way down the yard. But it all depends on what, where you listen to as well. Um, it's a different royalty rate in China than it is in America. Uh -huh. It's a different royalty rate in New Zealand as it is in Australia because everybody negotiated their own separate rights. Um, but yeah, I, I think the ability that artists could not have to wait 17 months and get a printout of 6,000 pages, <laughs> hoping that the record label didn't screw them over. Yeah, well, there's no like transparency right been, now, right? No, no, no. And there hasn't been in history, right. you know, true. When in the record game, there was never transparency. Dude, there. Uh, Chuck Berry sold his entire <laughs> yeah. catalog for fifty bucks. Yeah, you know, yeah. like there, there's oh, always yeah. going to be exploitation. There's yeah. always going to be people who will sell their mother for a hit <laughs> and not pay it. Um, but yes, hopefully down the road, and thus, if if Brian Adams has more streams that month than an indie artist, then yeah, damn right, Brian Adams should get more money from yeah. that. There, there should be no sharing in that than anything other than 
consuming what you're what you're doing. But I think where the where the issue also is is that you know if you spend ten dollars on Netflix, I don't know whether or not if every time I watch The Office, those creators are getting one tenth of a right. cent. It's I have just, no it's idea. Pulled. Right. Yeah, and yeah. really, I don't. But you probably don't care me. either. I don't care. Yeah, I do yeah. care. I want Greg oh. Daniels to get as much money off of my enjoyment <laughs> yeah. as possible. But yes, I, I think eventually that's what people it, that have been championing cryptocurrency yeah, and Bitcoin it, it, it could work, for 20 you know? years have been trying to do. Yeah, and I, I think just to address your other problem, I think, it, you know, it's, I think it's a stretch for, you know, either Bitcoin or either or what, any of those to, to replace, you know, fiat currency. But I can see... You know, um, supporting businesses behind that would do an instant convert, and you know, so you'd still just use your Visa card. You know, but it's it's interesting. And and and, and what came to me, and I, I want to ask this question to you, see what you think. There's been a craze, you know, in the last couple of years of these big funds buying the music libraries, right? Neil Young sold his uh, Fleetwood Mac. Uh, you know, there's 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 been a whack of them. Bob Dylan did the one for three hundred million, and I'm. And I was sitting there, you know, you're looking at 300 million, you know, and you're like, for Bob Dylan's library, and you're thinking, well, you know, most of his core fans are getting pretty old. Like, how are they doing the calculations to get the present value to figure out it's worth 300 million? And then I'm thinking, no, I think they're looking at this whole crypto NFT thing that they're, they're going to take songs and spin them out as tokens or something. I mean, maybe yeah. that's what, maybe that's the it, thinking. It, it's so many, it's so many things. It is, um, it is, you know, we're we're one of the first generations to um, to never be away from our music as much as we are. Meaning that when my parents were our age, there was no oldie station; <laughs> they were still playing hits. So mm. it didn't matter if you know when I was when I was seven. So let's say let's say forty five years ago. Let's say forty years ago. So in 1980, if you were listening to a hit music station, they would be playing the Beatles and the Archies and Blondie. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, yeah, it yeah. didn't matter what they were playing. And then in the 90s, there was a little bit of classic rock or, or you know, because still classic rock in the 80s was only, it was only, Led yeah, Zeppelin 10, was still around. Yeah, yeah, oh my God, yeah. the Beatles were still uncool. Yeah. You know, there were people still buying their records, but not to the extent of the, le you know, untouchable status because they were only a generation apart. And so now we're ending up with Boom FM, Dave FM, Jack FM, Bob FM station playing, you know, the best of the seven, you know, the 80s, uh -huh. 90s and 2000s. There's artists that I work with that have seen their royalty checks drop substantially who had their biggest hits in the 60s because radio just is not playing as much 60s stuff as possible because sadly those people are dying off right and right. or they're not listening to the radio so they're not a viable market for advertisers so when these companies come along and they start buying bob dylan well guess what's gonna happen i mean my kids kids are gonna be listening to bob dylan <laughs> Yeah. And and they're going to be listening to Fleetwood Mac forever, which kind of puts a lot of pressure on these newer artists because yeah. maybe 30 years from now, Drake and the others cannot rely on oldies radio. Maybe somewhere along the line, they're, they'll be off the radio while it's uncool to listen to them in when everybody's in their 30s and you'll never hear from them again. Yeah. Who knows? That could very well happen. Again, no guarantees. Um, but it's also going to be the advertising are going to be using those songs forever because they're yeah. going to want that money back. Yeah, um, yeah. a lot of incentive. And yeah. um, the last thing is, you know, and it's something that people really didn't touch on. Um, it's prestige. Mm -hmm. You overpay for a Bob Dylan. You overpay yeah, yeah. for a Fleetwood Mac to entice the other people to come on board with oh, you. Oh, okay. Because yeah. it's the yeah. level of trust that if Bob Dylan trusts this company for his catalog, then damn right I'm going to go sign with that company. The major labels were doing that all the time. Baseball players, sports people do that all the time. They do a $35 yeah. million no, no, dollar signing bonus, you know? 
Yeah, good point. So, but they're going to want that money back because the, the, those investors are going to want payday as fast as possible. So will you start to hear Bob Dylan songs in yeah. toilet paper commercials? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, I can't think fast enough for a song to throw away against toilet paper, but uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah. you, you got one? <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be a lot. <laughs> it's blowing in the wind, something there. Um, who knows How does where it the... feel to use Charmaine <laughs> toilet paper? There you go. There you go. <laughs> Deal. Done. <laughs> so regardless where the future goes, I mean, w w one thing will stay consistent. You know, if you're selling NFTs, you really can only sell them if you have an audience. So uh, a fan base is going to be number one based on a great song, you know, Grayson, you know, that's, that's here to stay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> we, we, I, don't worry. Yeah. That's, that's it. It, it, yeah. uh, it has to all begin and end with the yeah. song. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you need a fan base and no matter where the music business goes, it's, it's, you know, guys like you working with your artists. More people are listening to more music than any other time in history. And it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. I yeah. never wanted to tell people how they should consume music. I didn't care if it was on a cassette tape or a CD. There was one of the artists, Daniel O'Donnell, one of the biggest artists I've ever worked with in my entire history, was selling hundreds of thousands of copies in a year. 80% of it was on cassettes in wow. the 90s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Because that's how their audience can, wanted to still consume music so on their yeah. on their little cassette player or other Walkman because they were an older demographic. So yeah. as long as people were listening to music, I didn't care how. I just want them to consume their product. Excellent. So um, let's just uh, go on to the next thing that you've been doing, which is kind of cool, which, I mean, you do it in a much more professional way, but I kind of started this channel, so I've had a, a little bit of experience over the pandemic here. Uh, you host the Eric Alper show on uh, Sirius XM, uh, 167 is the channel. Uh, how'd you get into that? And uh, you've, you've interviewed some pretty cool guys. Like it's, yeah, uh, um, that, that's gotta be fun. I mean, it, I, I enjoy great. doing it. <laughs> yeah, it's the only time I get to talk to people. Yeah. I mean, in a conversation. <laughs> um, uh, I used to bring artists to all the media outlets, like sure. Canada AM and yeah. Entertainment Tonight. And, and one day somebody, one of the producers at Canada AM said, Hey, do you want to come on and do a segment about best box sets of the year? And I was like, yeah, not realizing that it's strange to have a, somebody working in the industry promoting their own industry. You would never have that because they would be biased, mm -hmm. but they always thought that I could be unbiased and never really play favorites to my own stuff. I was working and that was, um, I think that was probably about 10, 12, 13, 14 years ago. And you then said I added up. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I just kept doing it. I just kept getting out to do media interviews and talking about music. So whenever yeah. somebody died, I would go on the, I would get asked to give like almost the last rites or just kind of condense their lives into four and a half minutes of why <laughs> they were important. And then I, I was doing that for a couple of shows on Sirius XM. And then one day they just said, do you want to have your own show? And I'm like, no, why would I want that? Why? First of all, why would anybody want to listen to me for an hour as he looks at the clock and realizes that he'd been talking for 80 minutes? Um, <laughs> but um, no, because I'm not a radio guy. I have no experience working radio. I don't sound yeah. like these people that I grew up listening to on the radio. And he was like, who cares? Like, that's yeah. why we want you. So I just started talking to the people that I've always wanted to talk to for a little bit of time and that turned cool. into now five years of well, it's five years now, show. Right? yeah so what what, the, what is it uh, one day a week or what's uh, when's the show uh it's one day a week so it's an hour long show and it's usually three or four segments of 15 minutes each where i oh, okay. talk to All people right, cool. that i love that are artists and i never go inside baseball too much i don't yeah. geek <laughs> out in terms of like what kind of tones you use for that like for that guitar because i don't even know. you get a wider audience anyway yeah you don't want to i don't because yeah. i know that most people are listening are just like me they just kind of enjoy the music so you have you been doing them all from home during the pandemic yeah okay which is so amazing yeah yeah i used to go in the studio and do it but now i do yeah. it all on zoom like everybody else does yeah. and then, uh, um but it's been wonderful excellent excellent yeah it's a lot of fun so you're my second guest who does radio i mean jason mccoy i uh got yeah. to interview him jason's and, great uh, he's been on the show 
he's got awesome. a he's got a killer radio voice though. Oh yes, for sure. Yeah, I mean so, that's so do you. You've got it. You've got the <laughs> deep voice, but I oh. don't because when I get excited, my I'm voice goes all the it. way up here. I, I, if I talk, it's the proximity effect of the microphone. Right. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, like, you know what? Like, it's been a blast talking with you, and I uh, I appreciate. You. I mean, you're a busy oh, the guy. The pleasure's on mine. Yeah, you you're a busy guy. So it's been a lot of fun, and I hope. Uh, listen, the listeners got a little something extra out of this. We didn't talk uh, guitar gear, but we talked about the business, and uh, I, I think know that affects what everybody. Anyway, I know pickup. You know, I know pick up. <laughs> I, I know strap. Um, I've heard open chord a lot. <laughs> Don't know what it is. Couldn't play it. Um, don't care. <laughs> but if somebody said that the Black Crow's first album, which I think is awesome, is all about open tuning, amazing. Awesome. There you go. Good for them. Him and Keith no Richards. No clue what that means. Yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you, Keith Richards. Yeah, I, can, I my, my eyes tend to gloss over whenever I read that. Stuff. <laughs> That's but, awesome. Yeah, no, it's great. All right, man. Thanks for Thanks having me, man. I appreciate no. it. Terrific. Take care, man. Okay, see ya.